like to invite uh, Dr. Cosmas Lakison Zavazava, who will provide introductory remarks to our first panel that is indeed on open Europe in the world of open source. So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. For those who are online, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It is a great pleasure to be here with you. I could not miss this great opportunity to be among the engine that drives the world. I come from the International Telecommunication Union, the oldest United Nations organization established in 1865. We have a federal structure. We have a bureau which is responsible for radio communication. When you see a satellite going up, it has been registered with us. Spectrum is our business, standards our business. I head the development sector. So I believe sincerely that uh, impacting people is all about what we do. Anything that we do must have as an end result an impact of people, whether they are in least developed countries, in small island developing states, in the developing world, or in the advanced world of the world. And I think open source is beautiful in the sense that it signifies collaboration and cooperation. And thus, I heard some people saying that you are still small as a community. Small is great. There is a great spark in being small. That's why jewels are usually very small. So it gives me great pleasure to open this first panel at this remarkable gathering. Allow me from the onset to thank and congratulate the EU and Open Forum Europe for their continuous commitment to such an important matter in this world. This Open Source Policy Summit is great and is global and is people-driven, and that is what makes it very important. For us in the ITU, we connect the world. And as you all know, with all these emerging technologies, at the center of everything is open source. And therefore, we do celebrate. We believe in sustainable digital transformation. We believe in universal, affordable, and meaningful connectivity for all the peoples in the world. The International Telecommunication Union, with its development bureau, which I have the pleasure of leading, is focusing on accelerating the attainment or achievement of the 17, 17 sustainable development goals. And we believe that open data, open source, open standards do drive technology. The potential of open source to transform people's lives and accelerate sustainable development should not and cannot be overstated. Enabling open source software, data, content, standards, and AI models means facilitating access to the building blocks of modern day society and the future. Making them available for use, modification, and distribution is equivalent to empowering people with the essential tools they need to survive and succeed in the 21st century. The reason why in intellectual property there is a huge challenge in patenting software is because the source code comes from one person or one individual and other people build on. So to find novelty becomes a big challenge. Ladies and gentlemen, the potential of open source to transform people's lives is immense. Open source ensures that we all work together as an international community to make sure that everybody, including those that are struggling to make a living, benefit from it. So, like my colleague said earlier on, this is a symbol of a democracy, and that is very important. 30 years ago, the internet was built on open source software. It was a digital public good. Today, we may recognize that 1.1 billion people 
from the world is 46 least developed countries pay 20 times more than us in Europe to have access to the internet. And a shocking 2.6 billion people remain offline. And that is not good. This is why the United Nations Secretary General launched the Roadmap for Digital Cooperation, which identifies digital public goods as instrumental to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals and calls for a global effort to advance and support its creation. Think about this. And this is why it is important within the United Nations, interstate relations, diplomacy, to make sure that we bring technology and digital right at the center. This global effort is being led also by the International Telecommunication Union because our membership is very diverse and we are very unique within the UN family. We have 193 member states, so at the policy level, you know you are covered. We also have regulators in the telecom industry throughout the world from the FCC, which is the old, oldest regulatory authority, to the South Sudan, which is the youngest regulatory authority, they are our members. But the industry too and private sector are an integral part of our membership. And the organizations that you represent that are not yet, including startups, small and medium enterprises that are not yet members of the ITU are welcome. Feel free to join us. Academia, we have a plethora of academic institutions that are part of us. Together with these partners, we catalyze action on norms and standards around digital public goods. We conduct research and support stakeholders with the knowledge, tools, and resources to digital public goods. Distinguished participants, one of the greatest challenges in operationalizing open source digital public goods is the lack of capacity, be it technical, institutional, or human, to absorb, develop, and leverage open source. And I will not hit our chest as ITU, but we are big on institutional arrangements and capacity building from individual persons to communities, to countries, to sub-regions, to regions, and globally. Let me take the pleasure and honor of announcing here and now that we have launched a joint open source ecosystem enabler project. And I would like to thank the European Commission and the United Nations Development Program for their great partnership in this extraordinary people impacting initiative. The open source ecosystem enabler project will accelerate the creation of digital public goods globally and help countries develop and strengthen their open source ecosystems by establishing open source program offices throughout the world and providing them with tailored training and technical support. These offices, or OSPOS, will become robust and rely, reliable catalyzers for digitally enabled socioeconomic growth. We aim to co-design this framework with the open source community and first deploy it as a pilot. Too many pilots end up in accidents. So we are going to accelerate making sure that this project is replicated across the globe. Hence, I encourage you to be on the lookout for the open call. And we look forward to admitting you into this massive people-oriented project. I look forward to hearing from the experts represented here at the summit and those who may be speaking virtually and to learning from your success stories and challenges. Let this discussion be an opportunity for us to identify how to best operationalize open source digital public goods towards advancing society and putting all people on an equal footing. And I thank the timekeeper because she threatened from the beginning that she would be very tough. <laughs> <laughs> and she has been very generous with me. And thank you very much again.
thank you. I was indeed generous and I will be very short now. Uh, I will invite all the panelists of our first panel of the day, including Dr. Zavazava, so please welcome on stage. Uh, they will discuss Europe in the world of open source. Hi everyone, uh, nice to see you all. So it's my distinct pleasure to be moderating today's panel. And uh, first allow me to, I wanna start by introducing our panelists. So first we have with us of course, Mr. Dr. Kosma Zavazava, the director of the Telecommunication Development Bureau at ITU, the International Telecom Union. We have with us Ms. Carla Montesi, who's the director for uh, GRI, Green Deal Digital Agenda at DG INTA, at the European Commission. We have with us uh, Camilla Bruckner, who's the director of the UN UNDP office in Brussels and representative of UN system in the EU. And we have with us Deborah Camparini, who's the chair of OSEA, Initiative Secure Identity Alliance, uh, and technical director at the Standardization Bureau uh, and board of the Linux, Linux Foundation. So for a start, I, I spend my life in meetings convincing people why open source matters. So I'm here, I think it's the first time where I don't have to do that, I think you all know. <laughs> so I exhausted all my talking points, so I had to yesterday think of something else. So I'm here to talk to you about SDGs, uh, an important topic for us. Uh, it all started in 2015 where all our countries, all of us, got together uh, in New York and designed something that is really transformative, that is at the, car, at the core of everything we do, called the 17 goals. And these goals are, they are important for two things. First, they, are, they have their time bound. So they said, we have 15 years to get them, to, to, to make them happen. And we're now past the halfway part. And the second, important thing when they define the SDGs is they said this is not for one for governments to to deliver on this are not for uh, 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 private sector this is for everybody this is uh, all us and what we've been trying here is and the, the they helped us by identifying that technology is the main mean of implementations we would not be able to deliver on those 17 who goes from uh, uh, fighting finishing hunger making sure that everybody, uh, the, the health, the education, the, the equalities, the en environment, that the, for all of us to be able to work on that. And technology is the main mean. And here is that for us is more important now, open source is even more important for the delivery of SDGs. Why? Because of just the values of open source. They are the most aligned with the UN values. There is transparency, it's openness. It's collaboration, it's people who've never met each other who are working to go towards one same goal. So that's why we're now, at, at the UN, we'll, I don't know if you know, we have six official languages, French, German, no, French, Spanish, Arabic, Chinese, Russian, and English. And we think now of, open, of technology is the seventh language. Is that, and open source is that seventh language. Is what brings, is a, get people to collaborate. And here I have my, my, my open source, my personal open source stories that we launched with the, uh, as, as, as Mr. Bernardo mentioned, with the EU Digit, we launched the open source software for SDG, which is an initiative we call, hey, we say, hey world, please come help us fix, answer specific SDG, uh, challenges on SDGs. So we started with the first SDG, which is about education, and we said, please, can you help us improve Moodle? And then we have this incredible set of, 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 of solutions that were delivered from everywhere in the world. And we had a jury who had to find, pick a winner. You would never guess who was the winner. We were all in shock. It was an inspector in the Ministry of Education in Cote d'Ivoire who built this incredible module in the height of COVID, allowing building virtual classes and allowing schools to take place virtually in Cote d'Ivoire. The CEO of Moodle who was in the event couldn't believe and they promised that that module will be integrated uh, in, in future distribution of Moodle. So it is everywhere and it really is allowing a lot of incredible effect that happened. So uh, now how to go about that is really important is to make sure that 
capacity building, as Dr. Zavazava mentioned, we have to build capacity in the world. It's not easy. And we know that in personally, what, this is what I said, I spent my life convincing people, building open source within the UN is tough. Because if you stop 100 people randomly at the UN, you'll have maybe 20% who will hate open source, who will tell you absolutely not. And you'll have maybe 20% who will like it, and there's a lot in between. So there's a lot of, we need to change the culture, we need to convince, we need to tell stories, we need to show examples. And, and we know how hard it is to do it internally at the UN, so it is also hard to do it at the government level. So we need to hold the hands, we need to support these governments and make sure that, 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 that they have what it takes to, uh, to jump on that wagon. But also, most importantly for us, is really is also connecting these OSPOs. I can promise you the OSPO of Germany, I know they're building one, I'm, I can promise you they will have the same problem than the OSPO of Botswana or the OSPO of Morocco. And the OSPO of the city of Paris, I can guarantee you they will have the same problem than the OSPO of the city of Casablanca. So we need to stop the silos. We need to make sure that these, uh, there are mechanisms where we can connect them. So these are some of the issues that we are looking at and hope, uh, happy to, 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 work, to work with everybody here. And just to finish, I, just I think the two first speakers talked about it. I want to be the third one to talk about it, just in case you haven't heard it. <laughs> Is that in July 9th and 10th, we will be organizing the second edition of the OSPO for Good conference. Uh, first one took place last year in New York. It was a big success. We were a smaller group. Now we're coming with much bigger ambition. We want to have four to 500 people. And why? We don't want it to be yet another conference. There are tons of conferences about open source. It's that one we really want to have a lot of developing world there. We want to have the voices that we don't hear usually in open source. We want to have a platform where we can actually engage with them. We want to be that place where we can share successes or stories and do a lot of advocacy, but also to build partnerships, to build networks. So please mark in your calendar. You can Google it. There's a website went up last night just for today. So you can Google it, OSPO for Good Conference, and we're looking forward to having you all there. With this, let me now turn to first question uh, for my panelists. So Carla, how's uh, Europe facing the challenge of uh, supporting open source software uh, update and growth, especially for public administration and services? And how's Europe aligning with international organizations such as UNDP and such as International Telecom Union? <clears throat> Many thanks and uh, good morning, everyone. Very happy to, to join you uh, at this uh, summit. Uh, important moment of discussing uh, this, uh, this essential subject. Now, you're right to mention uh, European Union, uh, for the European Union digital transformation, it's a key priority in our strategy with our partner countries, in our partnership with states around the world. Uh, eliminating the digital divide, supporting a human-centric digital transformation, it's one of the key priority, one of the key priority of our strategy that we call the global gateway. And to achieve this, we dedicate more than 10% of our overall European budget dedicated to our international partnership for the digital transformation. When I mentioned this, it implies supporting skills, supporting capacity building, supporting uh, digital connectivity, supporting providing uh, services. And uh, at the heart of all this, of course, there is uh, the open source. Now, allow me to reiterate one essential point that was already mentioned before, that, of course, in order to achieve this uh, digital transformation, when we talk about open sources, some feature, important feature, has to be there. And uh, I just repeat the key words that is important for us also, that uh, this uh, open source will be, this uh, um, open source software will be public, because this is what will allow innovation. It's interoperable, it's accessible, it's safe, and this in include the fact that it has to be inspected. We need to improve security for everyone. And only if these four key main features are there that we can really ensure that uh, open sources will be a software that will benefit everyone. This is why we have a clear strategy at European level for the open sources. 
and, uh, and uh, just allow me to give an example on, that we apply an application at the European Union first. That uh, uh, it's uh, just last November, our co legislator have reached an agreement on e EDAS 2.0 regulation. In simple words, this allows Europe to have uh, to build the foundation for a digital identity wallet. This is just one example on which we really want to use this innovative uh, so approach that will rely on open sources. Has it was said as a clear digital uh, public good. So this is important, and of course we start with Europe, but we would like to work also with our uh, partners around the world on this on this element. But you ask a second question, and this is how we are cooperating together with uh, international organisations, has UNDP and the ITU, and of course. I mentioned Global Gateway, this strategy, apply implementing this strategy, we work with uh, many stakeholders, of course, public administration, private sector, civil society, but also with an international organization. And uh, I can mention two, just two examples of uh, this important partnership, because it's a very long, it's a very big, it's very important, but mentioning two examples, I refer to what the Secretary General already mentioned, uh, in last uh, uh, March, uh, we at uh, the UN General Secretary Assembly, we have uh, supported the joint SDG found digital window with a contribution of 30 million. This is an important contribution. It was just recognized by the Secretary General. And of course, uh, uh, this is done in fully partnership with ITU and the UNDP. One, uh, once again, as was just a reminder, uh, this uh, fund will allow promoting and uh, localizing open source software, working on open data, work on the standards and to ensure interoperability that will be key, the key success element to uh, succeed. But the second example that I wanted to give, it's what we bring all of us here, of course, today. It's the launch of this new initiative. It was already recalled. It's the open source, source software for enabling public service innovation. This will be an important new initiative in full partnership with ITU and UNDP. It was already mentioned. What is important in this new initiative to build capacity building? Uh, because we know that the most compelling issue that we have is that, and that governments around the world are facing with the open source technology is building capacity. And this will be the first objective of this new initiative that we are launching to get today. I stop here because I know that we will have a mm -hmm. deeper presentation later, so uh, I stop you for the moment. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Very impressive, all the work that you guys are doing at the EU, and congrats for the initiative that we are launching again today. Let me now turn to Deborah. Hi. Uh, Dr. Z Dr. Uh, Cosma spoke earlier about the digital public good, the DPGs and uh, the importance for the life of everyone. So now, tell us about uh, OSIA, so the Open Secure Identity Alliance, and uh, uh, as an example of key open source technology for digital identities and their interoperability. So if you could tell us more about it and why is it important to offer such a foundational building block for the open source community. Thank you. Have you ever lost your wallet? Well, imagine you take your backpack, you unzip it, you look for your wallet, you can't find it, you remove everything, you start panicking, and all of a sudden you have no, ID, no identity documents, no passport, no ID cards, no driving license, nothing. So you can't do much, right? Like, I bet you can't check in your hotel tonight, you can't travel back home tomorrow, you can't access most of healthcare services, this today is a reality for 850 millions of people around the world. And to put it in perspective, uh, in the European citizens are 
450 million, so that, that's quite a big problem, right? So these people are also known, also called the invisible. Uh, so those are people that have no means to prove their identity. They have no birth certificate, no passport, no, no ID cards, nothing. Um, they are mostly located in emerging economies. So you might tell me, well, what does it have to do with open source? And, uh, you know, there are other priorities. But actually, when we think about it, um, we, we want to fight child trafficking, right? We want kids to go to school. We want people to access micro loans or loans. So without identity, you can't do that. And this is why today identity is part of the sustainable development goals. So by 2030, we ought to actually give a legal identity to everybody in the planet. And government to do that they need to build digital public infrastructure. So complex infra infrastructure at national scale. And this is where OSIA initiative come in, founded uh, in 2019. So it's uh, a collaboration between governments and private sector. So mostly companies specialized in uh, cybersecurity or digital identity to tackle this challenge together. It is, as I mentioned, the digital public infrastructure for managing identity is complex. We, we might not even realize it, right? When you hold your passport, uh, be it in a physical or soon digital format, you, cannot, you, you don't imagine how much there's behind, how many infrastructure, how many um, technical components government need to set up, to deploy, to get to you as a citizen that identity and that passport. And like for every complex problem, what do you do? You break it down. And that, that's what we've done. We broke it down into smaller components. So as a, as a community that we've built, uh, we identified different building blocks, smaller building blocks that are needed for governments uh, to set up uh, identity infrastructures. And the second thing we've done is interoperability. So we, we have built, um, some, some, I'm not getting to the technical talks here, I'm struggling a bit, but basically we, we are building some, some rails to connect all these different building blocks to make sure that the, the overall solution is interoperable uh, via open standard. So this, this is important because uh, the, there is something already existing in the, in the governments in the country, so we don't want to toss away, right? We want to make sure that we leverage the legacy, we leverage the existing, we build on top, and that governments are not dependent, are not vendor locked, are not dependent on, on some companies and some products. So they are able to actually issue different smaller tenders where also some local companies can participate. So open standard was the first step of our journey. And now we've moved to open source as well. I think open standard and open source, marry, they, they marry very well. Um, and so we, we are working, uh, we are partnered with UNDP uh, to develop an open source uh, reference implementation of the open standard. Uh, so this is uh, very much uh, a journey in progress. Uh, on the open standard, we actually partner with ITU uh, for the recognition of the standard as, a, as an international standard. Um, so I'm conscious of time. There's uh, so much I would like to say um, on the lesson learned, but uh, hopefully if you, you know, I'm, I'm happy to talk about this topic and much more. So if you have questions, you can reach out to me later because I don't think we will have more time in this panel, but uh, thank you for the attention. Thanks so much, Deborah. <laughs> it, it is a frightening thought to losing a wallet while you're traveling. That's scary. So yeah, thank you for all the work you're doing there. And let me turn to Camilla. Uh, the digital public services that based on open source technologies, or as we know it as digital public goods, uh, are, 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 can benefit not only developed countries or countries who are developing these tools, but also can, like, countries who have from, have from scratch or not having local capacity as of yet. So how does uh, UNDP foster and support their sustainability and associated partnership across the world. So thank you very much and thank you for the invitation to participate today and congratulations with the, with the anniversary. 
So um, first of all, I want to underline uh, how important it is to have a positive vision for digital. Um, UNDP and ITU, we've done a shared research uh, that pointed towards the digital can help us accelerate towards 70% of the SDGs. So the digital is very much an enabler and not, I think, an end in itself, and we shouldn't also forget that. Um, <clears throat> and indeed, the open source uh, digital public good uh, communities play a huge role here. And UNDP is a proud co-lead of the uh, Digital Public Goods Alliance, so we take a very active part in, in this uh, community and development of of expertise. Um, and one example, just to give you an example, is the uh, work we do within uh, digital health, uh, where UNDP is currently implementing 60 uh, digital health projects, many of them based on open source solutions. For example, one of, uh, is called the District uh, Health Information Systems 2 uh, for hospital management that currently is implemented in over 70 countries and it supports uh, equitable health outcomes. So we see the power that uh, we can have when open source communities, private sector systems, and, uh, and uh, funders uh, and development agencies like uh, the European Union come together. Um, but there are, of course, also many risks, as we uh, are seeing um, a lot of the, these days, both in Europe, where we see use of digital to meddle in elections, the big risk here on very uh, relevant now up to the European elections, and we have a lot of mis and disinformation. Access to social media and harming to, to uh, the younger uh, generations and their mental health. There was this uh, senator's uh, or Senate hearing of, of the big tech uh, companies the other day that, that was just about that. And also the e-waste and the power used for, for, for data centers, which is, is huge. And, of course, this is mostly uh, a first world problem. Um, then, uh, Carla touched on it briefly as well, uh, and, and this, so this cosmos, this huge uh, inequity we have, uh, where we still have 2.6 billion people offline, I think you mentioned that, cosmos. And the digital divide is a significant concern because it can marginalize communities even further than they are today, and individuals, and leaving them behind as the digital economy takes uh, speed and, and accelerates even further. And it's also uh, damaging to the gender uh, divide. Uh, but more importantly, and this is one of the things I think that are really relevant today, is, is uh, the uh, governance sorry, and policy alignment, um, where digital technologies sometimes can outpace or often outpace development of governance frameworks. And this is where I think we have a real uh, shared interest. Uh, anecdotally, just to take the example of uh, the GDPR regulation, we've seen a lot of developing countries trying to adopt similar uh, policies, but they don't have uh, the, the capacity to enforce it. And that, of course, undermines uh, the, the, the trust and, and, um, and also the, the guidance uh, to, to businesses is, is weakened. So it's critical to uh, establish clear policies that align with the digital advancements and institutional capacity that, that uh, Carla also talked about. Another issue is, is as I said, trust uh, and the perception that technologies can be used for surveillance or curtailing freedoms. So we need to support governments to use and ensure that there is transparency around uh, how a data is collected and used and shared, and maintain uh, the public confidence that this is done in a, in a, in a way that is uh, uh, in the uh, broader uh, public interest. And here, open source is a very important tool to do this. But uh, there is a need for a concerted effort in the planning phase uh, of digital to include a wider stakeholder engagement. It cannot just be you know, uh, enforce that we really have to be inclusive in the consultations and in the communication so that people understand what we are trying to do. Um, on top of this comes cybersecurity, uh, where uh, many developing nations often encounter you know, difficulties to, uh, to uh, keep up with the rapid uh, deployment of uh, technologies. 
So that's another thing that we have to uh, think about when we work together in, in uh, helping our partner countries. Um, and then finally, uh, last point before I, I conclude is the, the maintenance, uh, where there's also limited resu resources for, for maintaining the systems that we, we set up. Uh, and, and this is classic to other things of, of, of our, you know, many 50, 30 or 30, 50 years of experience we have in development uh, uh, efforts is that we, we put these systems in place, but we forget that they have to be maintained. And it's just as relevant for uh, digital as it is and open source uh, uh, systems as it is for anything else. And here, back to Carla's point about skilled workforce uh, that is lacking in public administrations it, especially in low and middle income countries. And this is where UNDP and ITU are really trying to strengthen our cooperation to uh, invest in education and training programs and also build a talent pool that can uh, secure a more sustainable pipeline of uh, skilled professionals for the future. So, uh, yeah, um, all these questions of governance are, are really uh, key to, to uh, ensuring a human-centered, a human rights-based uh, approach. And this is where we see that <coughs> the EU and UN can play a really a very important role together, being very aligned on the ambitions of securing this uh, type of model for, for digital uh, development. And the uh, initiative that we are launching today is a clear example of how uh, we can achieve and come uh, together and the potential of this cooperation. Uh, so I want to thank uh, the European Commission and Carl in particular for your support uh, and the partnership. You are leading by example with the many regulations that you are putting uh, into life. We get you know, a lot of requests in countries about the DMA, the DSA, the recent uh, Digital Act. How is it going to affect us uh, and, and how can we also be inspired? And here we must use this opportunity with this uh, interest to uh, get in there and support these governments and, and scale this support uh, rapidly so that we manifest and, uh, and create uh, um, or secure that this model is the one that takes hold and, and not the model that is led by private sector nor the one that is uh, led by more authoritarian regimes. So really, this is a very important partnership that we need to nurture and, and develop. Thank you very much. Th thank, thank you very much, Camilla. And I, I like the point where you said about building the capacity and training and working on the workforces. In public administration, it's not in our DNA to work with the outside world. We just don't know how to do that. So this is new skills and new, 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 new trainings that we have to give to these uh, uh, new countries. And thank you for the initiatives. And also when I come back to the Digital Public Good Alliance, so I'm very happy and proud that the two organizations are represented here today, the UN Office of ICT and the UN Technology Envoy are also proud member of the Alliance. So we're around 30 members so now, so please check it out and see if your organizations also want to be part of the alliance called DPGA, Digital Public Good Alliance. For my last question, let me finish where we started with Dr. Zavazava. So uh, how does ITU uh, help uh, build uh, international capacity and mobilize resources uh, in countries who are in need uh, for help with open source technologies? Yeah, th thank you very much, and uh, it's a pleasure again to be on this panel. I want to thank my colleagues who have articulated most of the key points. I would summarize your question probably in three parts. One, uh, we should answer the question, why do we have 2.6 billion people in this time and era still being all offline? One of the things is what Camilla said, cybersecurity, confidence and security. We know that during the time of COVID, many young women and girls were discouraged from being online because they were harassed and harrowed during that period to the extent that some of it translated itself to offline harassment. And that's not good. And we do prioritize cybersecurity as an important element. That's one point. Second point has to do with affordability. Not everyone can afford the data. When you go to Africa, 
parts of Asia and the Pacific, you will realize what a challenge it is. Then the third component is the lack of digital skills, and that's where capacity building comes in. But in addressing this challenge, ITU will not be able to do it alone, or even UNDP, ITU, or the UN in general, we cannot do it alone. We need to make sure that we have everyone on board. From the ITU standpoint, I would like to address this issue and say we established what we call the ITU Academy, which is a virtual platform, but also from time to time we run a lot of courses face to face. And this saved us during the time of COVID because many thousands and thousands of people were able still to receive their education and to be equipped uh, with the digital skills. You see, when we are doing projects and you go to the Pacific Islands and you meet an elderly woman with a grandchild who is about five years, four years, six years, teaching her how to use a smartphone, it's inspiring. And we know from our statistics is that the ages of 14 to 24, and we term them in the UN language as youth, being the most active online. And that's why, again, we need cyber security to make sure that these children are safe. So child online protection is quite critical. So capacity building is very important for us. We also identified a segment of people who were not lucky, like you and me, to receive tertiary education, so we established what we call digital transformation training. And we run this throughout the world. Thousands and thousands of people are benefiting from this. Then we also have what we call academy training centers, where we partner with the Cisco, with uh, the Norwegian Development Agency, and we are doing wonders across the world. But all this needs resources, human resources, experts, but it also needs financial resources. And as I always say, money does not grow on trees. So we have to partner together. And I want to recognize the European Commission for their generosity in supporting many, many of our programs. Recently, we signed uh, a joint project on a universal, measuring universal uh, coverage, making sure that we know when we talk about connectivity, we are not talking about laptops, we are talking about people. So we must measure the meaningfulness of that connectivity. How can it translate in terms of disasters to saving lives? Uh, dealing with the sea rise, countries like Tuvalu, Maldives that are sinking, etc. So electronic waste management, space sustainability, etc., etc., and that is very important. So we have been very lucky in the Development Bureau of ITU that over the past nine months we raised about 23 million from partners to implement projects for the benefit of particularly those in the developing world so that they can play catch up. And also we launched, and you can Google it, what we call the Partner to Connect Alliance. And this partner to connect alliance is an alliance of the willing, those who want to put digital at the center. We we're talking about losing your wallet, but we also talk about financial inclusion. For women, 70% of the population in the rural, least developed countries are women and children. And they are struggling to go to the bank. They have to be on a bus for two hours, et cetera, et cetera. So we make it possible that way. And we have managed to raise pledges of about $36.8 billion to make sure that we bring services. And out of that, about 17 pledges valued at about 200 million relate to open source projects. So we think it is very important to link financial resources, human resources, to the development agenda so that people can participate effectively without looking from outside through the window and seeing what is happening inside without them having access. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kosman. <laughs> very impressive indeed all the work that ITU is doing and I've been working in partnership with ITU for the last 10 years and I've always been amazed about your 
capacity to reinvent and rebuild. I unfortunately I think the timekeeper is not generous with me as he was with <laughs> Dr. Zavazava. I've been receiving nasty looks. I started with with looks that I ignored and they moved to SMSs and I fear that now <laughs> there will be somebody coming and taking the microphone physically. So <laughs> with this, I just want to thank our speakers. It was very interesting to talk to you. Thank you, everybody. And we're happy to connect and catch up later. Thank you. Thank you, moderator. Thank you, the Open Forum Europe. Excellencies, esteemed panelists, distinguished participants, I am David Manset. I am the project coordinator of the new initiative that's been uh, recently uh, announced. And I would like today, together with my colleague, uh, Benjamin Bertelsen from UNDP, to officially unveil the project Visual Identity during this very nice summit. With the hands at the bottom and the cube at the top, this symbolizes mutual aid in together building our digital capacity thanks to open source. As an international collaboration, OC, this new project, receives funding from the European Commission under the Global Gateway Program for a 42-month global action plan to be carried out by ITU and UNDP. OC will develop a full and inclusive open source management program to support countries in their digital public services developments, providing them with best-of-breed education, training, and support, thanks to the deployment of concrete open source program offices in target countries. In other words, Ospos for good. Ben, you want to say a few words? Thank you, David. We are excited about this partnership from, uh, you can please take, uh, take, it, take it down, it's, it's okay. This fruitful partnership between our two UN organizations, the UNDP and the ITU, and our complementary strengths in this work, generously supported by the European Commission. Um, we urge you all to follow along. We'll be um, talking together with partners who can be hosts for OSPOS for, uh, for good into developing countries. This is the, the first and recent memory of projects working with OSPOS for public services into developing countries. Thank you, Ben. I would like to thank our directors uh, for having taken this, this nice uh, photo session with the new uh, project Visual Identity. Just for the symbolic, uh, the cube that they were holding is an open source uh, plant pot that we've produced, that we've released, that you can print at any scale. It's recyclable and it symbolizes growth and capacity. Thank you very much.